Hello world! Um, in today's video, we are going to look at how to execute an embedded systems project practically and what are the steps that you need to consider when you are doing a project, let's say at an MSc uh, level or B or BSc level, if it's your final year project or something of that sort. Or if you are beginning with embedded systems, then what is the best way to approach a project, but practically, all right? So this is not going to be just a whole lot of theory but practically how should you be approaching it. So I'll be breaking it down into few steps so that you can understand how I approached it and probably you can understand how you can approach it possibly. And the other thing is that will it be applicable to industry level projects? Then I would say that industry level projects are very complex because they involve a lot of teams working together and you know, the things are much more complicated because it's obviously industry level. So you will have ideation, you will have planning phase, you can have design, development, testing phase, and then field testing and all of that. So it is far more complicated. But when you are starting off, this is the best way to deal with an embedded systems project. And that knowledge will be helpful when even when you join an industry. So because the way in which steps are organized and the way in which, you know, um, step by step you approach a project that will still remain the same even in an industry level project. So yeah, let's look at the various steps that I considered and let's have a look at how I solve the challenges as well. So the first thing that I considered was choosing the right uh, electronic components. So and the first one being the microcontroller. So I have used MSP430 G2553 microcontroller along with the launchpad board. And I've been basically using this uh, microcontroller since my MSc project days. I have used it for uh, low power Bluetooth oscilloscope based uh, project. So, and it also comes in handy when you're considering low power applications, because with the advent of IoT, obviously you would want microcontrollers which will consume low power or which are more power efficient. And uh, in the MSP430 line itself, you have some microcontrollers which also have Sigma Delta ADC, and thus they are more power efficient. However, I didn't need a Sigma Delta ADC. I just needed a timer peripheral in this particular project. And G2553 has it and I have used it previously. So because of all these reasons, I used it for this particular project as well. So the next component that I've considered is the motor driver, which is L293D chip in this case. Now forget the term L293D or motor driver even and think in terms of what functionality is it trying to provide in this case. So basically it is providing you with high output current and which would be used to drive your DC motor and it is taking in low input current from your microcontroller. So when you start thinking in these terms, then you can possibly think of other components which can provide the same functionality and BJTs and MOSFETs can provide you with the same thing. And many a times in many circuits online, you can find these both are used and they're quite more efficient and everything has its own advantages and disadvantages. This heat dissipation problem with L293D IC, but I'm not going to go into the details of these right now. It is most commonly used so you will find the moment you type like interfacing DC motor with a microcontroller this is the first IC that will pop in so it is most commonly used so I have used the same IC but this certainly is not the only option and you can only think of other options when you think in terms of the functionality that it is trying to fulfill and not in terms of its name the next thing that I considered were batteries. So the first thing is how many batteries and the other is which type of battery. So if you're going for a project which is say mobile in nature like your line follower perhaps, then in that case you should go for rechargeable batteries. And you can use nickel metal hydride, nickel cadmium, lithium polymer or lithium ion batteries for this purpose. And they all have their own advantages and disadvantages. And I have ideally used two batteries for this project, one which provides you with 5 volts and 3.3 volts. And uh, this one is for your microcontroller and your L293D power supply. And the other battery is used for your DC motor itself. So it provides 9 volt via your L293D IC. So yeah, I've considered two batteries and I have used zinc carbon based batteries because I just wanted to use them for time being. So, but ideally you should go for rechargeable batteries. So this is how I finalized all my hardware components. And since I have used MSP430 microcontroller before and I have used L293D chip before, so I didn't really have had to bother about how am I going to connect them on the breadboard and everything. But if you are doing this for the first time, then you will have to refer to data sheets and user guides and stuff of that sort if you are not aware about a particular device. So yeah, and then make the connections. Then I connected all the components properly on the breadboard and tried running an easy piece of software. 
So the idea was to first check whether the hardware was functioning properly or not. If I would have added complexities to my software uh, software code in the first go itself, then it would have been difficult to find out the root cause of a problem in case a problem would have popped up. So that's why I ensured whether my hardware was for working all fine or not. And then I proceeded with the software related part. Now for the software, I basically wanted a PWM signal. So for PWM, you should be aware about the theory of timers, about how you can generate PWM signal and the different modes of timers and everything. And I have made videos on these topics. So feel free to check those in case you are, if you're not aware about those things. And yeah, after clarifying all these concepts, then according to the flowchart that I had presented in the previous video, I wrote my software code and then I burnt it on my microcontroller. I tested this code first on the launchpad board itself because the launchpad has got LED and the change in the intensity of the light due to PWM can be detected on the LED itself. So I didn't check it directly with the hard with the final hardware which has motors in it. Rather, I checked it first on the development board. So that is the advantage of using such boards. You can also like divide a complicated piece of software which is say lengthy. You can divide it into parts and check the relevant parts on the development board itself before loading it onto your final hardware. So that's how you divide these two things. That is testing of your hardware and testing of your software part. Now the code is written in such a way that with each button press, the duty cycle changes between two values. When you press the button for the first time, it will be 85% making the LED appear bright. And when you press it for the second time, the duty cycle will change to 25% making the LED appear dimmer. And with each successive button press, the duty cycle should have changed or alternated between these two values. Ideally, this should have been the case, but with each button press, I was getting some unpredictable result. So I checked the software code and everything seemed fine. But then I came to know about this problem, which is called as button bounce issue. And I will not cover what this is, but you get to see this beautiful waveform on the oscilloscope on each button press. And as you can see that it has a lot of jitter. And this is what resulted in unpredictable results. Now there are two ways to solve this problem. You can tackle it in the hardware itself because it's a hardware based issue. You can use an RC filter that is low pass filter. And afterwards you can connect a Schmidt trigger, which would give you even more reliable output or else you can go for software based solution, which is what I have used, wherein you use a while loop and wait in the while loop till the time the button retains a particular stable state. So you can also use a timer based solution in the software itself to make this even more efficient. So these are the two ways. Which solution should you go for hardware based or software based depends upon a lot of criteria, the cost involved and the size of the board and um, how many components you would like and a lot of factors come into picture. So most of the times people would go for software based solution. And I think that's where the true power of embedded systems lie. It's a perfect marriage of both hardware and software. So anyway, I went for the software based solution. I checked everything on the launchpad board itself. It all worked fine. And then I assembled my hardware and software together because I had checked the hardware previously. So it was the time to assemble it all together and to check whether it was working properly or not. And everything worked as expected. Also, if you're using the button for the first time, then it is important to know that it can be connected in either pull up or pull down manner. And this is important because that changes the default state of the button. That is, it can be logic low or it can be logic high. So depending on that, the code will change or the ISR that you're going to write for the button press will change. So keep that in mind. And yeah, this is the final tip. So yeah, that is what really went behind the scenes and that's how you can execute your project. These are the various steps practically which were involved. But uh, there are three important skills that you will need in order to execute such projects. The first one being a lot of patience and concentration and by a lot, I mean a whole lot because some days you will not get the output and you will have to deal with it. And there'll be a lot of frustration because of that, but then you need a lot of patience. That's the most important thing. And ask any embedded systems engineer, they will say this definitely, you need a lot of patience. Second is you need basic knowledge of electronics, specifically if you're not coming from electronics background. And the third thing is knowledge of C programming language, because that is the language which is currently preferred in the industry. 
So yeah, if you have these three things, then you are ready to tackle these projects. And with that said, this is the end of the video. But before I end it, I want you guys to do four things for me. That is like the video if you found it useful. Comment if you have more suggestions or ideas to provide. And uh, share it because you shouldn't be selfish. And <laughs> subscribe to the channel because I need your support. And I'll continue making more such content for you. So yeah, that is it for today. Bye world.